So thank you for joining us, Jim and Sean. Um, so, Sean, I believe you ruined Jim's holiday by voting leave <laughs> last year. Is that right? Apparently so, yes, <laughs> according to Jim's witness account of uh, <laughs> his morning coffee. And uh, I didn't mean to, so I should apologise for that. Uh, and many other people should too. But <clears throat> I think that... Um, I think you've got to be realistic about it. I think that there's a lot of sentiment, pro-Europe sentiment, amongst so-called anti-Europeans and vice versa, if you like, on the other side of the channel. But I think that it's going to get quite bitter, much more bitter and nasty, this divorce, than it is now. Whether you're in favour of it or not, because I think it's inevitable as these arguments start to flare up, no matter how much goodwill there is towards people, you tend... You tend, you're going to tend to get it. And that is that is the regrettable thing. That is a, a real negative of the process. And um, it will repair. And you hope that the arrangements when they come in, such as they are, will be fair and reasonable and people, you know, you will minimize this sort of ill will. But on the other hand, um, one of the things that makes a lot of European people hate other European people is the European Union, I'm afraid. Um, like the Greeks and the Germans who rubbed along okay for the best part of uh, seven decades, I think, after the Second World War. And um, when the Eurozone crisis kicked up and there was a huge resentment, the, the Greeks resented the Germans imposing conditions on them. It was the Germans of the European Union, same difference you know, and putting up their taxes, cutting public spending, throwing people out of jobs and so forth. And the Germans resented sending ta German taxpayers money down south where they thought they were all lazy and it was going to get wasted and all that. And they hated each other. And people in Greece were drawing swastikas on walls again. So, uh, and demanding reparations for the Second World War. So the, the, the sort of, the European Union isn't always an engine for harmony. And I think the extent to which people in Europe with a big E are feeling united and happy and they have this sort of comity and they have this sort of feeling of being in one nation state or something. That's certainly not true. I mean, it's just not true. There's, there's, the elites do, if I can use that word, the elites do, when you see Macron on the television, like Holland and all the rest of them before in Sarkozy, they have the European flag and the French flag equal status behind them. But no one's convinced, I'm not anyway, that the French don't put the national interests first and they're chauvinistic and, and so forth, because they are. So I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced that um, the Europeans love each other uh, as much as you might think. I, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I was saying the Europeans love each other. I wasn't yes. saying the European Union's perfect. I merely was saying that it's in our national interest, as you um, correctly said, that we should look out for our national interest, but it is in our national interest to be part of the biggest free trading area that the planet has ever seen. Um, and, you know, we always focus on the negatives for the EU in this country, and everyone always focuses on the negatives because it's really a convenient whipping boy. Every time something goes wrong, you ring up the press office from the government treasury or the Department of the Environment, oh, well, that's a matter for the European Union. And you dig a little more deeply and you'll find that it isn't a matter for the European Union at all. It's a matter for the British government, which they've just tried to palm off the blame for someone else, as they always do. And one of the very few benefits from Brexit will be that the government will no longer have its convenient whipping boy to lay off its own failures onto, which is what it's been doing for years and years, and which what created a lot of the resentment which led to Brexit. Uh, you know, it's all unnecessary. It's all Westminster's fault. You could actually look at devolution and giving pound councils more powers and mayors more powers as the government just thinking, oh, we haven't got Europe anymore to blame for our own problems or our failures and the mess ups we commit. I know. Let's create some devolved authorities and let's give some powers to some men, not really real powers, just some limited powers. So we can then blame them when people ring us up and say, oh, this problem here that you've caused, oh, no, 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 it's a matter for them. Mm. So, you know, I don't think the European Union is, is, is the problem you say it is. It's a big free trading zone. It's actually moving in our direction. For a start, we had a sweet deal. We had a deal which nobody else had. We got to keep the pound. We didn't buy into a lot of the regulations. We have opt-outs here and opt-outs there and opt-outs everywhere. And we had more than any other country got. And again, we, we don't like to look at this. Everyone said Cameron didn't bring that much back. And he, he didn't get all that much, but we had a lot already. Mm. We had loads of, of opt-outs. 
Now, given that the European Union is moving in our direction anyway, as you correctly identify in your piece, that Junkers looked at it and said, actually, you know, this big supranation thing we were doing, we're not really going to get there, are we? In a couple of years' time, this debate was unnecessary. Cameron stupidly called the referendum when he arguably didn't need to because he thought he could win it. And, you know, two years down the line, three years down the line, we might find it's a sort of free trading concept and less of a supernatural ogre than it is now in the minds of some um, in, in a couple of years' time. The problem is, of course, we have now given control to the loons, the Euro haters, the people who just really dislike Europe and all its works and everything to do with it. Cynical opportunists like Johnson and Gove who just lied repeatedly again and again and again and again and are making this much worse with all the bellicose nationalist tub thumping. You know, one of well, I, I say Brexiteer ourselves. I, I don't mean Sean here as, as, as that because, you know, all right. I, I think he's wrong. You know, and I, I disagree with him, and he and I have debated for years and years, and disagree on a lot, but we we can still, yeah, we can still be friends. Um, but the problem is, you you don't hear what Sean, the case Sean makes for very for very many people, all from anyone really on the Brexit side. It's all this bellicose nationalist tub thumping, and you know they're doing Britain down, and you know they're queuing up. We've got all the aces. They're queuing up to do, pre and it's all so unnecessary. You know, I was speaking to someone who was quite senior in public life said you know, if may had got on a plane when the vote happened or after the vote happened and said to merkel and Hollande, whoever it was then you know look we've got a problem here can we sort it out it would have been very much easier and it could have got a lot easier as it is the extremists have taken control and we've moved on not just from brexit we've moved on from you know, Farage during the campaign was saying we ought to look at the Norwegian model, which was membership of the free trade area, just a little bit more arm's length, which I would, you know, I, I wouldn't like that. But I would say that would be a realistic thing. And we've moved from that to an extreme position where we're just going to crash out. How, how is that going to help anyone? It's, it's a really it's a really desperate and stupid situation we've got uh, we've allowed to get ourselves into by handing control to the extremists and they're making a mess of it davis seems to be a little bit more realistic than some of the others um hammond is 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 the the, the sole realist in cabinet and even he's sort of kowtowed to that awful little liam fox who wants to sell us all chlorinated chicken from the US so he can show that he's actually done something with his time in cabinet, as opposed to just wandering around and shaking his fist. So, yeah, we've handed control of the extremists, and we're going we're gonna to make a mess of this when it's unnecessary, because it was moving in our direction anyway, and we had all the opt-outs we needed. Sean, what do you think about the transitional deal and the way that it's currently being negotiated? Do you think it's as bad as Jim makes out? Well, yeah, a bit probably, more light. it probably is. <laughs> there's they're one thing very, we can agree on. Not then. Brexit bulldog, as uh, David Davis gets called on the radio by the impressionists. He's, I don't think he's making a very good job. Of it. I don't think anyone could make a, a brilliant job of it actually, because I think that the the time scale is so short. The sequencing arrangement we have to sort out the Irish border, the European Union citizens, and some other things before you talk about trade, the divorce bill. Before you talk about trade. Uh, is loaded against the British. So the whole negotiation is is loaded against the British. That's not a sort of nationalistic thing. It's just that if, you, if you're if you negotiating with somebody else and they're a much bigger entity than you are and you've got a short time to do it, um, you're in a weaker position and you haven't got... And at the end of it, you're the one who's going to lose out because you'll crash out and so forth. So I wish the transition would work and I wish the negotiations would go better than they are going. Um, and so that's something that worries one. And I think that... Um, but we've made it much German... worse, haven't we? We we have made it a lot worse by the attitude the government has taken. Possibly, And the confrontational yes. attitude it's had at the outset. Yes, but I always think, as I say, that there's there's a degree of... There'll be a degree of this sort of rhetoric, especially in the, in, in the press, uh, and this sort of anti-European feeling, and then on their side, anti-British feeling, and resentment, uh, like a sort of jilted lover or something. Um, there'll be that inevitably. And I think you've got to face up to it. I think that, as I say, that will that will happen. It would be in everyone's interest to have a transition period of some sort. It would be it would be in everyone's interest to have a sensible deal. Now, if and when those things arrive, I think Jim and I would be in favour of having a vote for the British people on that because I don't think that 
uh, I would agree with the critics uh, who say that the British people didn't vote for losing jobs or crashing out or you know may, making having the aircraft not being able to fly into Europe and all these things. And that's perfectly true. And I think people ought to be able to look at the deal at the end of it and say whether we want it or not. And then you get you get a lot of politicians who agree with that, some of them privately, some of them publicly, uh, and ex-politicians like George Osborne, who's actually very pro-Europe, anti-Brexit, but actually doesn't think that we should have another referendum. Now, if we don't have another referendum and Brexit really is inevitable, I think you've got to be clear-headed about that. And you've got to, for those of us who voted for it, and who are sceptical about Europe, which I am, and remain so, I think you've got to recognise certain things. Would Theresa May have got a deal if she got on a plane the next morning? We, we'll never know. It's possible. But and she didn't I would try. Hope so. Well, no, she didn't try, because, I mean, she formed a view, which I think would be a perfectly reasonable one, actually, that Europe is, to put it mildly, is pretty hard to reform. The individual nation states in Europe are, by and large, hard to reform themselves, especially France, Greece, for example, difficult countries to govern. Uh, and then the European Union as an institution is hard to reform. Tony Blair was trying to do it nearly, well, nearly going on for 20 years ago. He was telling them you can't be a sort of protectionist island in the world and expect to hang on to your prosperity forever behind a tariff wall. You see, the European Union is a huge free trading area. <clears throat> and it's the biggest probably economic block in the world, biggest market in the world probably by far, one of the most prosperous, if not the most prosperous, with amazing free movement. All the things that ministers, as George Osborne said, all the things ministers are trying to negotiate now, we've got already. You can well make the argument for Which that. Which is my point. It's a perfectly good point. But the, the other point about it is that it is protectionist. It puts tariffs up against the rest of the world. It puts non-tariff barriers up against the world, even bigger ones. It doesn't allow free movement of people who happen to be outside the European Union. So no free movement for the Turks or the Ukrainians, but there is for the Poles, for example, and so on and so forth. Now, in my view, I agree with Tony Blair from those years ago and, and David Cameron, David Cameron, by the way, who tried the negotiations and failed, that the European Union is unreformable um the british do have some opt-outs that's true but the but the i think as i say the big picture is that europe is a slow growing zone in the global economy its prospects are poor uh, even with reform the prospects are poor there's a lot of things it's mature the demographics are against it there's too many old people not enough young people all that so those things are against it the eurozone is is structurally unstable and prone to continuing sovereign debt crises, bank crises, and all that. We haven't heard any for a while, so I think people think it's all right. I don't think it is. It will never be solved. And so you have to say, like Blair did all those years ago, but he didn't act and take the logical conclusion, do you want to be in a protectionist island, a very big one and a very comfortable one, which is where we are now? Because one day Europe will entirely lose its competitiveness and in that circumstance, it won't be a, it won't be prosperous. It won't be creating jobs. And parts of Europe, Germany, for example, is doing well and is prospering at the moment. That's perfectly true. But a lot of Europe is not. A lot of Europe is is completely stagnant. Um, they may have a few quarters of growth better than you know the rest of the world or worse than the rest of the world. The big picture is we know where the growth is. The, the economic growth is in the rest of the world. This is the point I was trying to make in the piece. Probably not. Clearly enough, which was in the 60s, the, the, the French, the Germans, the Italians were all growing at the sort of rates that the Japanese uh, were growing at as well. But in our day, the Brazils, well, Brazil's up and down, but India and China consistently growing at nearly double figures. Uh, in those days, the 50s and 60s and 70s, it was India and China who were actually outside the world economy to all intents and purposes, hardly grew, mired in poverty, hun not just a few, hundreds of millions of people in poverty, didn't have the money to buy anyone's exports in the first place and were pursuing a sort of socialism in one country. That's gone now. They're the dynamic, fast-growing market economies and we've got to plug into that part of the world economy and unplug ourselves from the Europeans. Just as in the by 1973... We unplugged ourselves from the Commonwealth or the Empire as was and plugged ourselves into 
what was the dynamic, fast-growing European economy, although by that time it was running down. But that had enormous economic advantages for Britain. No doubt about that at all. But every decade, you've got to look at it afresh and say what's in the British interest. And now, Jim, you're our chief business commentator. So you Indeed. are on the ground speaking to business leaders about Brexit. Indeed. Do they share Sean's view? That no, I'd... they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. No, nor do all They're these... quite comfortable. <laughs> nor do all, these, nor do all these, these countries which Sean wants to plug us into. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. It's a great idea to, to plug into the, to where the growth is. But all these countries have actually said to us, Japan actually wrote to us and said, look, what, what do you think you're doing? Uh, we, we want you here. We want you in the European Union. We like you in the Union for two reasons. Number one, we can come over and trade with that market that we talked about um, and we have we, we, we can get free access to it. And number two, we, we quite like you being in there because you're right wing and you push for all the things we, we want to see happen. Now, I don't necessarily agree that we should be that right wing, but you know, that's an entirely different question. They all want us in it. All these parts of the world which say they want to, that you say we need to plug into, they want us in the union. They want to do deals with the union before they want to do deals with us. All the business, all the respectable business leaders you speak to want us in the union. There's only a few sort of, whatever, mad people like the bloke who runs Weatherspoons who seem to care nobody but you know, the supermarkets, you know, tax the supermarkets more and give me everything I want and keep us out of the European Union and the bloke who runs JCB, all the other business leaders and a lot of small business leaders as well who are going to be really struggling now if they trade with Europe because they don't know where they are. Mm. They, don't, they don't know what's happening to us. The damage that is being done to them, the damage that might be done to jobs as a result of this, we haven't really seen filtering through yet, but we, we may very well do, because in fact you yourself argued we might see a disruption to this mm. greater than we saw after the Second World oh, yeah. War, and it is utterly unnecessary for us to do that. Most of the people who voted Brexit didn't like immigration. That was the thing. Uh, there are there are some who believed in the lie that we'd get 350 million a week for the NHS, which was an absolute lie. It was a blatant, bald faced lie of the worst kind, which they carried on punting even after the Office for National Statistics says it was wrong. But, you know, park that and let's let's go to the issue about immigration. Australia said, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd like to do a trade deal with you. Can we have free immigration as well? We'd like that. And India. Yeah, we, we'd like more movement. We are at the moment don't actually really want to do proper trade deals with these countries because we're saying to oh 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 yeah we want to trade with you but we don't want your people coming here. So it's well, a sort true. of it's a schizophrenic attitude we're having. We're going for this we're saying we want to trade with the world and we want to be a global Britain but we also want to shut our doors to all these countries. Well you can't have both. No, I agree with that and I think that's that's um a shame of it. And I think that's one of the things that's got to be looked at when if and when the time comes, I mean, time's short anyway, and it may, you know, your Brexit may fall on people's heads before they realise that they haven't, <laughs> they won't have a chance to have another vote on it because there won't be any time to have another vote on it. You wouldn't be able to organise another vote on it even if you wanted it. Although you would be able to do that in Parliament, uh, but it doesn't look like the parliamentarians and the Labour Party want to uh, reverse the trend. But that's one of the things that's got to be looked at. And I think that that's what I mean by a sort of sober calculation. I mean, if it's the case that the, all the damage that you do in the short run is so grievous and virtually irreparable uh, that all the benefits you might get in the longer run are outweighed by the damage in the short run, you wouldn't sensibly make the decision. You'd stick with the comfortable pool of prosperity that you happen to be in. And wait in for the European Union to move in your direction, which well, it's doing anyway. It may, it may have, may have and I don't think there's much proof of that, not much evidence of that. But you would do that. So that's why you should have a second vote. But I, I, I think it's possible that, um, although I wouldn't put much money on it, it's possible that the, the British and the Europeans will finally agree something that uh, is you know, rather untidy and so forth, but, but preserves some things at any rate and doesn't move on to w WTO terms. Do you honestly We're trust worse people than like WTO. Johnson and Fox? No, not and really. And, and these lot of... these Not I mean, to a great extent. I'd probably, to be honest with you, I'd probably, in a weird way, I'd probably trust um, Johnson more than Fox or David Davis because I think that Johnson is uh, cleverer 
uh, despite the appearances <laughs> and the uh, professional buffoon uh, routines that he does. I think he's a lot cleverer and smarter than they are. And I also think he's massively more flexible um, in a sort of Churchillian way, uh, which is uh, <coughs> who he wrote his uh, biography of. Because he, I think he's just the same as Churchill in the sense that uh, he's no world statesman, but he puts his own interests beyond party. Uh, just so. Yeah, <laughs> about the same as the country. But and the if, problem if is, if he Boris sees Johnson, his own... If Boris Johnson thought he would get on by recommending that we stay in the European Union because the damage would be so great and we, you know, they won't let us have this and they won't let us have that. Therefore, we've got to stay. And he would do it. He would shame for... And he would like, like Donald Trump. like a common Trump. piece, Sean. Yes. We will get you to write that next well, week. Well, it's the same, it's same as tr- I, I, Trump's I'm doing not... now. He's, he, he's got such a massive ego. He's so sure of him, so shameless that he can just switch around anytime. But anyway, that's what, I, that's what I think about that. I think it would be better. And I also think it would be far, far better if... The British lost uh, a lot of the phobia about immigration. I think that maybe the part of the problem is this, this what business Brexit... that it's not been talked about sufficiently for so long. Well, arguably. Amber Rudd's commissioned her migration report, um, which presumably is a way to rectify the situation. Yeah, I mean, she did it after but Brexit, which seems a little bit too late. But when she was there talking about, but the other know, thing when, is when that Rudd was Rudd was the one talking about registers of foreign workers. So I'm not sure, sure yeah. she's entirely, and you know. People like the Japanese, people who who run our industry, Mm. when the Conservative Party basically wrecked what we had here, are are now almost all from overseas. Sure. And they are screaming and shouting, saying, we need to get our people in. We we want our people managing these things because your people aren't very good managers. And they're not, by the way. We we do not specialise in good management in this country at the moment. Um, so they want their, to get their people in and they're tearing their hair out because the home office is so inflexible and because we're supposed to be anti-immigrants. And, in, you know, it, it speaks volumes at the Brexit thing. We're supposed to have this global Britain. And yet, you know, one of the abusive treaters, I, one of the many abusive treaters I got after the piece, so thanks for reading it, guys, um, said, you know, stay out, we're full up vandalized on the white cliff cliffs of dover and that's yeah. the attitude which which well, brexit see, that's is... the, that's the thing and it's funny you mention the japanese because that's what they're like they're not a poor country by the way but they're, they're not but growing, we're not we're not talking about fast. japan we're talking about no, no, britain no, no. But and what's what in our interest that... in and our interest is in letting them get their people in well, so they can that. run our interesting but keep people employed it's just an observation more than an argument really which is that um the British do seem to have a phobia about migration. They may be right, they may be wrong, but it's a sort of political fact now um, that you have to deal with, or politicians have to deal with, journalists don't have to deal with, they can say what they like about it, but politicians do have to deal with it. And it seems to me that the British, when you look at some of the polling, the answer basically comes back, we don't mind being poorer, losing jobs if you like including losing one's own job according to one of the polls yeah but they're startling yeah vince cable but 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 they they say that if we don't get the migration that's how japan thinks the japanese like being a monocultural society they 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 have a even bigger phobia far bigger phobia probably than the british about multiculturalism about you know, diluting the national identity, all this stuff. That's why they don't let hardly anyone of any stripe into Japan to live and settle at all. They're extremely insular. But we're not a monocultural society. No, no, we're not. But um, what I'm saying is that the, the 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 Japanese are actually in a similar position because they're they're quite well off society, but extremely Better off slow. Than us. Yes, on some measures, but very slow growing. Um, nobody to look after the old folk, no young folk to go into work or anything. They have to rely on high productivity and companies working abroad and all the rest of it to, to keep the economy going. And the vast borrowing to try and get people to spend, they won't spend. That's what's happened in Japan. And to some extent, we're a sort of mirror image of them. We're, we're way different in terms of multiculturalism, that's, that's right. But what I'm saying is that an attitude that says we're not actually that bothered about the economics... We just want a society that's, that's well, in their case, monoculture. And in the British case, they would say no more multicultural, no more people of different backgrounds and so forth coming in. 
that's how the British are thinking at that's the moment. That's how the polling And Jim, you're last. That's so how I the think polling we're a little bit behind you. The, the, the polling says they're thinking. And they do. But if you look at that poll and you look at the demographics of that poll, yeah. as Vince Cable rightly pointed out, you've mm. got a core of largely... And I, I, and I, I want to be careful here because I don't want to tag the entire baby boomer generation with, with being awful, but 60% mm. of them are. Uh, and you've got this core of of, of this, sort, this sort of 60% baby boomer core of elderly Brexit jihadis who says, we don't mind losing our jobs. Well, they don't have jobs. Uh, we don't mind our relatives le- losing our jobs. Well, that's just the selfishness they've shown for a long time mm. and, and something which really... It's not something which should be encouraged and it's something which, which frankly should be ignored and fought against. Um, so you've got these people saying that. But if you look at the young who are going to inherit this country, Hi. they're much more com- comfortable with a multicultural, with Europe. Um, they want the jobs. And so if you're citing that poll, you need to look at it in a little bit more detail. And the more detail shows that actually... There is a much more comfort with a more international Britain among the younger generation than there is among the older generation. Uh, and we need to listen to that. We need to think about that because that's this country's future. And that, they, these people, these elderly jihadis that Cable um, identified need mm. to remember who it is who is going to be looking after them and paying their pensions. Now, that's the and that may be the difference between us and Japan. I don't know what the younger generation in Japan thinks, by the way. Maybe they're good with immigration as well. I don't know. Mm. But it's certainly true that the younger generation in this country or a majority of the younger generation in this country is comfortable with it, is comfortable with a European mm. identity as well as a British identity. Because, you know, it's like it's almost like, you know, Sir Chris Hoy said when he won his medal and when the Scottish referendum was, was happening, he, he didn't see an issue with him being Scottish and British. Yeah. Well, the younger generation and people like me don't see an issue with us being British and in being European. The two, we, we don't see any conflict necessarily mm. between the two. Um, so that's what you have to remember is this, it's not a case of the entire country is anti-immigration. It's just the older part of the country. The younger part of it is comfortable with it. And the older generation, obviously, are the the ones that politicians are pandering to because they vote. So. But young people are, m- are more likely to vote now with Corbyn's Labour and also have a political memory. So whichever party negotiates Brexit might be consigning themselves to the, the um, electoral scrap heap for and a while. Indeed so. And, and you know, if, but if we might have one to finish off thing about soon, this Jim. that's <laughs> happened is if it persuades the younger generation to vote and to exercise their franchise and to make sure that they don't have their future stolen from them by their grandparents. Um, And, you know, I hope that that, that's one thing they take from this. Get out there and vote and don't let it happen again because it needn't happen again and it shouldn't happen again. And if there is another referendum, sure wants, and actually as I want to, you can can make for a different result this time. Well, thank you for coming in, Jim. Thank you, Sean. 